Great. Good morning and welcome everyone to the January broadcast of the LEA Special Education Point of Contact monthly webinar. We're going to go ahead and get started today. Okay, in today's agenda for January, we will be um, briefly reviewing uh, establishing assessment accommodations, the transfer student policy, since this is that time of year where you may see a lot of student movement or students transferring uh, to different LEAs. We'll review the comparable services requirements for out-of-state, in-state, and from DCPS to charter LEAs. And we will uh, discuss documenting those comparable services and SEDs. And finally, we will end with reminders and announcements. So let's go ahead and jump into uh, the material for today. Presenting on establishing assessment accommodations. Jen, you all ready? Yep, I'm ready to go. Hi, I'm Jennifer Carpenter, and I'll be speaking with you today about establishing assessment accommodations. Um, this may be a review for many of you, but we're going to uh, uh, send uh, in the follow-up email some guidance documents to help you. But uh, just a quick review that there are three levels of uh, features for accessibility that are included when students take high-stakes assessments. The assessment platform includes features that are built in for all students that they can access at any time. There are accessibility features identified in advance. Um, that uh, must be identified at student res registration in the student's personal needs profile, um, and that has to happen in advance. And then certain accommodations are available only to students with disabilities or for English learners with EL plans. An example of an accessibility feature available to all students, or a few examples would be a pop-up glossary, external spell check, a line reader tool, and repetition of directions. They are available to all learners. It is uh, best practice to introduce these features to students in advance of the assessment. Accessibility features that must be identified in advance in the student's personal needs profile would be text-to-speech for a math assessment, color contrast, breaks, um, that's a test administration consideration. And then also small group testing. Accommodations you might find in an EL plan or in an IEP or 504 would be read aloud for ELA, a human signer for test directions, the use of a calculation device, and a screen reader for ELA or literacy. Again, these have to be identified in advance. They have to, um, in the case of students with disabilities, appear in their IEP. In the case of students um, who are English learners, it needs to appear in their EL plan, and they need to be um, identified in advance in student registration through the personal needs profile. The guidance uh, for student registration and for the personal needs profile has been updated for 2019 test administration. That guidance document is going to be sent to you in the follow-up uh, email after this webinar. Ah, let's not forget for um, English learners, the word-to-word -word dictionary and translation of math to Spanish, those are examples as well. Also um, included for you in a follow-up email, you will see the testing accommodations guide. Uh, there'll be part one for students with disabilities. The date says 2017, 2018. This guidance still applies. The updates are to student registration will be sent alongside this. Part two is for students who are English learners. That um, guide will be sent as well because some of your students are duly identified. So these accommodations for students with disabilities or English learners are intended to reduce or eliminate the effects of the student's disability or their English language proficiency on their ability to perform on the test. These accommodations do not uh, change the bar, the expectation. They don't uh, reduce the learning expectation or the expectation for demonstration of understanding. They do not reduce the scope or the number of items, the complexity of items, or the rigor of the assessment in any way. It is important that students um, who will have receive accommodations on the test um, use them in daily instruction. 
it is a requirement that they do so, but it's also very important for the student to be familiar with the, with the assessment accommodation before they use it when taking the park or science assessment. All right, I'm going to pass it on to our next person. Feel free to put your questions in the comment box, and I'll get back to you at the end of the webinar. Question, yes. Jen, before yeah. you uh, mm -hmm. move on. Um, so should they only be suggesting accommodations that students have previously used? Well, that would depend on where they are in the IEP process, but there will be students whose IEP dates come up against the testing dates. And so um, as long as they're going to have an opportunity for the student to use that, that accommodation, um, you want to make sure that you're setting students up for success and that your practice and assessment um, proctoring is in alignment with the IEP document. Awesome. Any further questions? Okay. All right. Good morning, this is Christy Weaver-Harris. I'm the policy manager in K-12. You all have heard my voice before. Um, today I'm gonna speak a little bit to the IEP implementation for transfer students policy. Um, and we're specifically focusing on uh, what your requirements are for comparable services. So the IEP implementation for transfer students policy came out in 2014, um, and it provides specific responsibilities for LEAs when students transfer into a school from in-state out of state um, or private schools, and when that student either has an existing IEP or a pending referral or an in-process um, initial evaluation. So these kiddos can be in a, many different stages in the process, and the policy has a lot of very discrete uh, requirements around timelines and responsibilities uh, for those kids. I'm just going to get into a little bit of it today. I'm not going to go through the whole policy. Um, and I, if you've been around for a little while, you're familiar with this one, and we know that it's a doozy. It's a policy that is up for, um, uh, we're going to be revisiting it in the next, I would say, year or two. So you may see some changes come down the line. But uh, in that event, we would be publicly proposing the policy, and we'd make sure that we present some information on it in this webinar, too. Uh, so nothing to worry about for now, but just have ideas in your head if there's some things that you particularly don't like about this policy. Um, so this policy, like I said, governs um, those students who are transferring um, during the school year. And under uh, Chapter 30, LEAs are responsible for students transferring between DC LEAs during the school year, you're responsible for those children upon stage four enrollment. And between school years or during the summer generally, um, you're responsible on the first day of the new school year. And that is actually um, a discrete change that we made over the summer. It's something we're going to be continuing to talk about because we know it has um, some pretty wide impacts to change um, the responsibility. So prior, you were responsible for those students transferring between school years also upon stage four enrollment which we know created some issues with ESY and student records transfers and all of that kind of mess um, and we hope that we resolved some of those issues by changing this to the first day of school for the upcoming school year but we also know that there may be some unintended consequences there so we're taking we're continuing to take a look at it if you had any issues with it or if you have any ideas about that please feel free to send me an email um, and at the bottom of this uh, slide, you can see there's a link to the policy. It's also available. That, that link is on OSSI's Special Education Policy and Guidance uh, webpage. So for student records, the LEA must request um, the student's records from the previous LEA within five business days of enrollment, and the previous LEA must respond to that records request within 10 business days, and that includes um, the transfer of paper documents if necessary. Most of your documents are likely to already be in SEDS, but there may be some additional documents around um, behavior or attendance that may be outside of, uh, of the automated transfer uh, of that student's record. So if, there, if you have additional information about that student and an LEA reaches out to you to ask for the student records, please make sure that you're providing all of those students' records. Um, if the student is transferring from out of state, you must upload the IEP into SEDS within 10 business days of receipt. And that, to me, is a kind of a long timeline. As soon as you get that IEP, you should be uploading it into SEDS. We want to make sure that we're providing necessary services to these kids as soon as possible. Um, and if the new LEA is unable to obtain the student's IEP, you still have child find obligations around that kid. So if mom comes to you and says, oh, we just came from PG County and she 
was getting services, but I don't have the IEP, and then you can't uh, get that IEP from uh, either the parent or the school, you have reason to believe this child may be a child with a disability. So you have child find obligations to be collecting data data and conduct an initial evaluation if you think that's uh, necessary. Um, and I would treat mom saying that the child had previously received services as a referral. I would. Um, so I would encourage you to be judicious and uh, pay attention to what you're hearing about students who are coming into your LEAs. If a student transfers with an in-process or incomplete initial evaluation, you as a new LEA must make reasonable efforts to obtain parent consent for the evaluation and then complete the evaluation within the timeline requirements, which we've gone over quite a few times. You all know that you have 30 days from um, referral to make reasonable efforts to obtain parent consent and then 60 days from obtaining parent consent to complete your eligibility determination. But this is one of those exceptions to the initial evaluation timeline. So when a student transfers into a new LEA with a pending evaluation, the initial evaluation timeline may not apply if the parent and the new LEA agree to a new specific timeline, but only if the new LEA is making sufficient progress to ensure um, that that initial evaluation is being completed. I see that we have a question. Um, so the question is, do student records include transcripts? You have a challenge um, obtaining transcripts and that can affect ACGR. Yes, when an LEA reaches out to you and asks you for a student's previous, for the records of a student who had previously attended your LEA, it is actually extremely important to make sure that you're providing those transcripts um, so that the LEA can determine uh, the, the courses that the students had previously taken in to make sure that they're awarding appropriate course credit. And this is a huge issue in the district that we see because we have a very highly mobile um, population of kids. And with our uh, culture of school choice, kids transfer quite frequently. And something that is not well understood and is not highlighted well is that when a child transfers between schools, especially during a school year, those credits don't always transfer with the student. So please be providing, as a sending LEA, please be providing those transcripts so the receiving LEA can make a determination as to where that student should be in their educational progress, okay? And when you are reaching out to the previous LEA, be specific about the kinds of documents that you want to see. Specifically mention um, any history of special education services, um, EL services, um, 504s sometimes are appropriate to ask for, 504 plans and always ask for those uh, transcripts so that you can see um, what classes those, that your kids have taken. Thank you for that question. Um, so when a student transfers with an existing IEP, if it is an in-state transfer, and by that we mean an LEA within the district, so either um, a charter to another charter or a charter to DCPS or from DCPS to a charter. If you are a DCPS school and you are receiving students from another DCPS school that is not considered a transfer, they are within your LEA and you are to be implementing that IEP as it is so that student is not a transfer student. Um, for in-state transfers, so like I said, between charters and, and DCPS or between charters and charters, um, a new uh, LEA must make a decision about the appropriateness of that IEP within 30 calendar days of enrollment. So you have to decide whether you're going to adopt the IEP as it is or develop a new IEP. If you elect to develop a new IEP, you must do so within 60 days of enrollment. Um, and that is a timeline that we're going to be taking another look at because it seems uh, in the context of the new initial evaluation timeline, that feels like a long time. So uh, again, I would emphasize the importance of providing services to these kids as soon as possible. So if you can do that sooner than 60 calendar days, I highly encourage you to do it. Um, for students transferring from out of state, the new LEA has to treat um, receipt of the student's prior out of state eligibility as a referral. So that can be mom telling you that the student received services in a previous state, um, or that can be actually getting the IEP. So within 30 calendar days of that referral, the LEA must determine if an evaluation is necessary. 
And there's a lot more information on this in the policy. I didn't want to get too into it because we really want to talk about how to document comparable services. And comparable services is where you will be documenting services that you provide to your out-of-state transfer students. Um, and also private school transfers. So when a student transfers from a private school, the new LEA has to conduct an evaluation within the required timeline to determine if the child is eligible. So these two scenarios, out-of-state transfers and private school transfers, I just want you to be thinking about when a kid transfers in with an existing eligibility from another state, they have technically not been determined eligible under DC criteria. The criteria is different, um, and depending on the, uh, the eligibility category, the criteria can be different and often is different between states. So that's why we encourage um, an evaluation here and that's why we require it for private school students. Private school students were not receiving services on an IEP. They're receiving services on an individualized service plan, which is different because those kids are not entitled to the depth of services uh, provided on under an IEP. So for both out-of-state transfer and private school transfers, you want to take a look at, you want to be collecting data as soon as possible to determine whether an evaluation is necessary for out of state transfers and to aid in your initial evaluation for private school transfers. Um, and after 30 days of referral for out of state transfers, you have to take a look and determine if the evaluation is necessary. So in that situation, you as the LEA, you have the authority to say, yes, we believe an evaluation is, a full evaluation is necessary and order additional assessments or you can say, no, we're confident this kid is, is eligible or is not eligible, and then move forward through, this, uh, through the IEP process or through the eligibility process accordingly. Um, so for students who are transferring with expired or expiring IEPs, you cannot adopt that existing IEP if it has already expired or if it will expire within 30 days of enrollment. So we have a question about a student transferring um, out of who has an out-of-state IEP and the parent does not want their child to receive services in the district. Um, and the parent refuses to conduct a comparable services meeting. So in this situation, you want to treat the out-of-state IEP as a referral, um, document it as a referral in the system, and then reach out to the parent and attempt to obtain parental consent for the initial evaluation. And at that point, if the parent refuses to provide parent consent for the initial evaluation, you can close out the, um, the student's referral in that situation. So you should proceed as though it's a normal um, referral, it's a normal transfer referral, um, and obtain to get parent consent for the initial evaluation. And then when she refuses, you can, um, you can close that out. We also have a question about a student who had received, who had uh, attended a private school who had been receiving ISP services from DCPS and has a current eligibility in SEDS and is now transferring to um, a DCPS school or a DC charter school. For that student, you must conduct an evaluate, a full initial evaluation. You can use all of the existing data that is in SEDS to aid in that initial evaluation, but you do have to conduct a full evaluation and develop a full IEP because the student had been previously found eligible for services, but was not receiving the full board of IEP services under that ISP. So you want to make sure that you um, redetermine that they're eligible and then move forward with developing a full, full IEP. So students who are, are attending private schools and who uh, are under an ISP are not entitled to many services at all, to be quite honest. Um, I believe right now it's, a lot of it is um, consultation services between the, the school districts, so between the Archdiocese and DCPS, and then I think there might be some uh, speech therapy provided right now, but the student is really not receiving what you would traditionally believe as being appropriate under an IEP because they're not entitled to those services um, under IDEA. So when you receive an out-of-state transfer, the new LEA, in consultation with the parents, must provide FAPE in the form of comparable services to that transfer student who has an existing IEP. So comparable services are similar or equivalent to those um, described in the existing IEP, and this can include equitable services being provided to a parentally placed private school student um, as documented on the ISP, and that's what I was just speaking to, is that students in private schools are only eligible for equitable services, which is not the same um, as IEP services. 
Uh, the new LEA must implement comparable services as soon as possible, but no later than 20 calendar days after you get that existing IEP. And comparable services must be tracked and documented in SEDS. Um, In-state IEPs are automatically transferred within SEDS. So you, when the student transfers in, if they're coming from a charter school or a DCPS, um, you will automatically be transferred the full student's IEP. You should be providing services under that IEP and taking the 30 days to um, take a look and determine whether you think those services are still appropriate. And then you determine whether you're going to adopt the IEP or develop a, a new IEP. For out-of-state students um, on an IEP and private school students on an ISP, those must be manually updated into SEDS using the transfer student intake process in the comparable services tab. And Reed is going to walk you through that in just a second. Any so some tips on um, transfer students. You want to be asking incoming students who are stage four enrolled if they have previously received special education services. I do not encourage you to ask prior to stage four enrollment because of, of uh, prohibitions against non-discrimination in the enrollment process. You cannot ask students when they are first applying to your LEA, just in the application process, whether they have received special education services or not. Um, OSSI asks that through the lottery system, but we actually pull that information out um, to ensure that there's no, to, to reduce the risk of uh, discrimination against students with disabilities. So after a student is stage four enrolled and you generally, we know that like you reach back out to the parent and you say, here's a thousand documents you have to fill out, or here's our website for you to enter in all of your information. At that point, you should be asking if the student has an IEP. Uh, once you receive a transfer student, we want you to be reaching out to the previous LEA to request the records as soon as possible. Um, that can move things along in the process. We also want you, when you, when you receive those, uh, the documentation for that student, we want you to pay attention to eligibility and IAP due dates so that you can be planning for triennial reevaluations. Um, and you're paying attention to when that IEP expires because you can't adopt an expired or expiring IEP. So we know that a lot of the time you'll get a kiddo that that's transferring in and they'll be due for a reevaluation um, relatively soon. You want to make sure that you're calendaring that out to get the reevaluation completed within the three year requirement. Um, we also want you to begin collecting information and data on student performance as soon as possible so that you uh, have as much data as possible to determine the appropriateness of the existing IEP or whether a full evaluation of an out of state transfer student is necessary. Um, and we also want you to be providing comparable services as soon as possible, but no later than 20 calendar days after receipt of the existing IEP. Um, and when you are reviewing existing IEPs, do not adopt an IEP that at that point you know or believe is not sufficient to meet that student's needs or has deficiencies or issues. Um, even when, so you're meeting with the parent and you say, we're just going to adopt this IEP right now, but we'll amend it in the next three months. Or we know that there's an issue. We think that your kid doesn't need six hours of speech a week, but we're going to go ahead and adopt this now, and then we'll change it in the next couple of weeks. Don't, please don't do that because you are acknowledging at that time that you believe that's, that that student has an insufficient IEP, and you're also telling the parent, we believe that this IEP has issues. So you don't want... If you receive a transfer student with an IEP that you believe the IEP is insufficient, please develop your own IEP. Please remedy those deficiencies and do not adopt the IEP. Um, before I turn it over to Rita to talk about to talk about documenting comparable services and SEDS. Oh, thank you, Sandy. Sandy Watson from DCPS has clarified that students under ISPs are receiving only speech services. So thank you for clarifying that, Sandy. I appreciate it. Um, so when you do receive a student transferring on an ISP, you really want you have to be doing that reevaluation and you want to be considering all of the possible services that that student could receive. All right, I'm going to turn it over to Rita Larkins to talk about documenting comparable services and SEDS. All right. Thank you, Christy. Uh, this is Rita Larkins, um, and I am going to be walking you through documenting those comparable services uh, in SEDS. So, 
So uh, this first slide just really kind of recaps a lot of what uh, Chrissy has already gone over in great detail uh, regarding when you need to actually um, complete the comparable services uh, for a student. And that just kind of outlines that. So I won't spend too much time with that, but basically um, it's just telling you that the new LEA is going to use an existing IP, as Christy stated, as the referral using existing student data and to create a new eligibility determination in SEDS. Also, the new LEA can upload an out-of-state IP and create the comparable services document. So that's really what we're doing uh, in this section when we document those comparable services. So first is to work with the school registrar to ensure uh, the transfer student is properly enrolled and shows up in SEDS. So when that student is um, physically in your building and you have done a stage five enrollment, that also uh, dictates whether or not you're able to see their SPED records uh, in SEDS. Next, you'll go to the comparable services tab in SEDS to begin the transfer student intake process. And I know that this process has changed many times over the years, uh, but right now we are at the comparable services and that's what you should be using uh, to bring in IP information from out of state. The image that you see on your screen now are really just the steps uh, that you would go through in the comparable services module in SEDS. So the first step as we I uh, have already discussed is to complete the transfer student intake. Um, complete the comparable services tab and then you will go through all five sections uh, that will allow you to move on to the next level to create a finalized uh, eligibility or IEP for the student. All right, so in part one in the transfer student intake, once that out-of-state IEP is obtained and entered in SEDS with a cover sheet, uh, or you can also upload this. Uh, everybody knows that you can scan it in on your computer and upload this file. Uh, this same process can be used for ISPs, your individual service plans from private schools. Next, in part two, you're actually using the information from the existing IP. Uh, for the specialized instructions and related services that are similar or equivalent to what is listed on the out-of-state IP. So you're entering the amount of time that they are receiving specialized instruction and any services, such as in this example, they're receiving 60 minutes per week of speech outside the general ed setting. So you're documenting that information uh, in part two, and that's going to help you to create your letter. Next, you'll go to special education transportation. This is where you have to determine that that student is eligible uh, to receive special ed transportation. And this page uh, for transportation in the process will actually allow the team to determine if that student qualifies for those uh, transportation services. Next, in part four, this is where you will go through the ESY section. Uh, this will allow you to quickly determine if the student qualifies for ESY without waiting for the full IP process to be completed. And this page actually replicates the ESY page that's in the regular IP process. Uh, also, additionally, it does include all ESY eligibility worksheets. In the last step in comparable services is where you will create the comparable services consult letter. And this is the last step that captures additional information needed to generate the comparable services consult letter. So your LEA is going to, or your, rather your LEA designee will sign this letter. Uh, the letter and the copy of the IEP, the out-of-state IEP are also provided to the parent in addition to a prior written notice for initial provision of services. So what I'm going to do is pause at this time to take just a few questions uh, about this section.
Okay, so to address just a few questions that have come in in our question box, uh, does the parent need to sign the initial consent for provision of services? Yes, the parent does need to sign off on that and then you need to upload that document into SEDS. Uh, I'm not clear about that question, so I'm going to keep moving. So if your question was not addressed uh, during this webinar, we will send a follow-up and address your question individually uh, it, if it does not uh, pertain to the wider audience for this webinar, but we will address your question. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Pauline Miller-John and I work in DAR and I'm just going to talk about a little bit about the non-public SEDS access. Okay, so we have been getting a couple of questions from non-publics as how they do they get access to SEDS and I just wanted to reiterate um, this slide based on what we discussed in the start of school and a couple of the SEDS trainings that we've had previously. SEDS access for non-public staff requires that OSSI, the non-public, and the LEAs work together. Um, some of the key players are the non-public SPED point of contact. Each non-public campus has a designated point of contact who's responsible for coordinating SEDS access for non-public and training the non-public staff on how to use SEDS. The LEA STPOC is also responsible for overseeing SEDS access for any user. So once OSSI creates the account for the user, um, the LEA is supposed to assign the designated user access to that non-public building and also assign students to that non-public user. The OSSI help the staff only the non-public SPED POC and the LEA SCPOC can communicate with the staff by using the OSSI support tool. So um, some of the questions that we've had is like, we're not getting access to our students. Um, we're not sure if we have access to SEDS. And um, I just want to make sure that you as the LEA is helping to mitigate the um, the frustration for some of the non-publics who cannot access the students in which they're serving. Some of the um, other stuff we have, I have some archive resources, um, getting started with SEDS, related services, um, provision 101 webinar, you can see the link here, also navigating the initial evaluation process, there's also a link to that. And we also have the SEDS basic user guide. It's about 200 pages, but it's actually a good read and have a lot of screenshots and instructions. So I think it's very helpful. I also use it myself. So um, these are some resources we have for you. So feel free to use those and also reach out to us if you have any questions. Any questions? I'm just going to pause to see if there's any questions coming in. Also, something I wanted to bring to attention, um, the LEA PMP has been updated. I know many of you have been looking forward to the new updates. Um, you'll get more communication about that coming soon, but it has been updated. Um, I have a question coming in. 
says for the non-public access, is there a particular step that is being missed by the LEAs? Um, um, some of the questions that we've had is that um, I have my aggregate account, but I'm un, um, un, I am unable to see the student. So when I look at the aggregate account, I realize that um, you as the LEA have not assigned the appropriate school to that user and also have not assigned the student in which the user is servicing. So um, most of the times, if the, if the school is assigned, sometimes the student is missing. If there is um, some miscon if there's some information that is not related to the non-public user, um, please make sure you're responding to their emails, responding to the non-public SPED POC, because they're the ones that are actually um, feeding a lot of the questions from the actual um, users. I'm just going to pause again for some more questions. I'm um, on the line for, for any more questions. As a reminder, the best place to get information from from OSSI is through the LEA Look Forward. Um, I hope that you are all receiving this, but if you are not, please subscribe. You can you can do that by sending an email to aussie.communications at dc.gov. Awesome. Thank you, ladies. All right. If you have follow-up questions, I will leave this up on the screen. This gives you a number of places to contact uh, all of your favorite folks here at Aussie for DAR. Uh, Aussie support tool or your DAR liaison, uh, also our policy email, tote and transportation, and statewide assessments. As a reminder, our next webinar is Wednesday, February 20th. I'm sure you are all registered uh, for that webinar already, so we will be expecting you on that date. If you have any follow-up questions or any other information uh, that you'd like to share, please feel free to reach out to us. Okay, so I understand that um, some LEAs may be out of school during the week of February 20th, President's Day, right? So we may look at um, actually changing that date uh, it, to go along with President's Day, but we will communicate with you via email. Okay, if there are no more questions, this concludes our January special ed points of contact broadcast. Thank you and have a wonderful day.